Hello, everybody. Welcome to Monday Night Live. My name is Derek Arden, and today we've got Graham Jones, the internet psychologist, with us. Uh, Graham does a number of different jobs. He's the business school director at uh, Uni- University of Buckingham, has written many sales books and consults on the internet, particularly sales issues. Welcome, Graham. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Thank you for having me again. Going on since you last joined us on the internet uh chat gpt twitter blue tell us all about it i can't i'm no longer a twitter blue he's taken it away from me oh because <laughs> i've refused to pay and um, for those of you who haven't caught up with the news elon musk bought twitter and lost 20 billion dollars in the process um and even more as the share price of tesla plummeted as a result of it all but other than that it was a great idea um, and in the interests of um, the freedom of speech, he's uh, said that if you were already uh, an authorised person who'd been checked out and you had a blue tick, then um, you were going to have to pay for it. And uh, most of us have decided not to pay. And he started giving them back to people because not enough people have got blue ticks anymore. So there's almost no one on Twitter with blue ticks. So in order to give people blue ticks, he's giving them back. And so far as I understand it, most of the people who've been given them back have complained they don't want them back because it makes it seem as though they're paying and they don't want to be seen to be paying. When So they're asking all those people, many of the people who've said who've been given the blue tick back, have complained to Twitter saying, please take it away because I do not want to be seen as though I'm paying for something. (laughs) So um, (sighs) I've never thought Twitter had a good business model. Well, it had no business model to begin with. Um, I suspect we're in the um, death throes of it. Oh, isn't it interesting? I mean, 44 billion, he overpaid for it. And then he was forced by a US judge, wasn't he, to actually complete the transaction which he tried to get out of. Has this guy got good judgment? You shouldn't answer that. But, you know, he sent a rocket up. It exploded after 10 seconds and he said it was a success. I well, he's not an engineer, that. so he's not a space engineer. So um, it's, you know, he's got a big team of experts who know what they're doing. Um, and like a lot of these things, failure is good because now you know what not to do. Um, you know, it's the old... Um, light bulb thing isn't it you know a thousand goes before we've got the light bulb right kind of thomas and, edison you've got in mind yeah. there haven't you i love that quote fantastic quote i found a thousand ways not to invent a light bulb yeah okay so that's twitter blue what about this chat gpt yeah what about it exactly what do you want to know <laughs> i want to i want to know um what? why we should be using it and uh how universities are going to handle cheating from students yeah it well cheating from students has always existed um so um it's just how do you keep it down to a minimum uh chat gpt if you haven't uh, caught up with the news is a method of uh, creating anything from scratch and doing all kinds of things that's original um and that uh, nobody's ever written before and that will not show up on any plagiarism checkers and uh, is pretty good. So all the tests of ChatGPT show that it's producing some very good output. So, for example, uh, it was given the uh, bar exam uh, and it passed with flying colours, got a distinction in the bar exam of the UK. Um, It is uh, now a a member of the Royal College of Physicians because it passed the MRCP exam. Um, So (laughs) it's, it's very clever. Um, And it's nowhere near as clever as it's going to be because all the data it has is only up until 2021. Um, So everything it's coming up with is based upon information it had until 2021. It's got lots of stuff that will make it even cleverer, but they haven't switched that on yet. So it's there waiting to be switched on. Um, And then, you know, so if we can see it doing things now that make it very clever, um, those things that make it even cleverer uh, are going to be a real serious threat to lots of lots of things. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, um, using a bit of chat GPT and another bit of artificial intelligence, last week I decided that I wanted to set up an online consultancy business uh, that would be teaching people how to benefit from understanding uh, the world of psychology if you wanted to be an entrepreneur. So aiming at would-be entrepreneurs, uh, get them to understand a bit of psychology to help them improve what they're doing. Uh, this is a fictitious business, by the way. I have no intention of doing that. Um, uh, but so I used ChatGPT and I used another AI program. And within five minutes, it had built me a website, including testimonials from my happy customers um, with their pictures uh, and links to their websites. Uh, it had produced me uh, 100 um, social media messages for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, and all I had to do was press a button and it would have uh, got me a, a recommended domain name. Um, and then all I'd do is press another button to buy that and uh, it would load everything up and it would send out all the messages for me. So that all of that would have taken 10 minutes maximum. Um, so uh, needless to say, I didn't press the buttons, um, but it just shows that, that if somebody has an idea for a business, no longer does it take you. In fact, I, I tell students about this, that, you know, years ago, um, those of us are old enough to remember the olden days. I know there's only me and Derek who can remember the olden days here, but, um, <laughs> and Godfrey. <laughs> but those of us who can remember the olden days know that, you know, when you start wanted to start a business, you had to find a lawyer, an accountant, you had to fill in a load of forms, you know, you had to let the inland revenue know, you had to do a whole load of things. It would take several months and cost you two or three thousand pounds worth of capital just to get going uh, before you even started. Um, and um, you can do that now um, in 10 minutes online. Um, and it's even and that's just to get you going. Whereas now you can do it in 10 minutes online, not only get yourself going, but all the content you need and everything prepared by artificial intelligence. In other words, the very basis of your business is created for you. So presumably you could set that up, get people starting sending you checks and you'd have no business model at all. So it's wide open to um, fraud. It's not open to fraud. No, it's it's open. What it does is it means that the competitive nature of business, uh, the internet has made business much more competitive, but this has made it stratospherically more competitive. Hmm. Okay. So um, if you think you, you're competing against a whole online problem now, in a year's time, it's going to seem like these are the easy days. What, what should we do about it? Should we all sign up for chat GPT, start paying them £20 a month and go for it? Um, if you want the best of chat GPT, yes, because the server is limited from the current public version. So the, the paid for version is version four. Uh, the current public version is 3.5. Version four is like, I, I think it's kind of logarithmic numbering. Um, I don't think, you know, version four is just half a bit better than version 3.5. It is amazingly better. Uh, so I pay for the, the $20 a month. Um, and it's, you know, it is very, very um, significant what it does. So I think if businesses are not engaging with it, um, again, other businesses are going to engage with it. And it means that we're going to get left behind. So if you don't engage with artificial intelligence, you are going to get left behind big time. So we've got one, one or two people who are trustees at schools on here, and then we'll have them watching on YouTube. Um, you told me earlier that the universities haven't got together to see what they can do about uh, chat uh, GPT, but that surprised me. But what about the schools taking A-levels and O-levels and uh, issues like that? Yes. What's happening? So all the exam boards are concerned about it, um, that face-to-face uh, -face, um, exams, you know, old-fashioned sitting in a room exams uh, where you've got invigilators and so on is going to be not a problem um, because uh, nobody's allowed to take any devices in, the invigilators check and so on. So the kids are going to have to use that. The problem with that kind of exam is that it doesn't actually check understanding. 
Uh, so those those exams in a room were really useful when we couldn't do anything else. But actually, they are pretty useless in determining whether that child understands, you know, maths or understands biology or whatever they're doing for their GCSEs or A-levels. Uh, the, the, all it tells us is what they remember. Um, so you can remember loads of things, but not understand them. So uh, it, traditional exams are pretty useless at checking uh, understanding, but they were all we had 25, 30 years ago kind of thing. Whereas now we can do all kinds of things using technology to check understanding. Um, but that means that the students will then have access to the technology, which means they'll have access to artificial intelligence. So you you then come around to going, well, the only way we can do this is go back to old fashioned exams. And that doesn't help anyone, doesn't help the students. And it certainly doesn't help uh, industry. Um, so that what we need to do is if businesses are using ChatGPT and they are using ChatGPT and other forms of artificial intelligence, we need to know the students know how to use artificial intelligence. So we should be examining them on it, examining them on their, you know, assessing their use of it. So uh, we, I've built a, an assessment for students at the moment where uh, we get them in a room and uh, I divide them into thirds. So one third of the room, uh, they're given, everybody's given the same uh, piece of work to do. One third of the room uh, only uses chat GPT to come up with some answers. One third of the room can use any internet access to anything except chat GPT. And one third of the room has nothing other than themselves. They can't look at anything. Uh, they've just got to use their, their brains and come up with an answer. And they've all, they're all given 20 minutes to come up with an answer. And then what they do is they put all the technology away and we see what each of those groups have come up with as an answer to the question. And then we can critically assess which one did which and which bit of, say, chat chat GPT was good for doing something and which bit of the internet was good for doing something and which bit was better done by human thought. Um, and so when you do that, you can begin to show students good ways of using artificial intelligence and not just think, well, that's the answer. We just rely on that and only use that. So universities are getting chat GPT within the classroom. So we use it within the classroom now. And remember that ChatGPT was only launched last November. It's not even six months old. Uh, and the difference is artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. It's not new. Um, the difference is um, this form of AI, and we're only in, there's two forms of AI, really, artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence. Uh, we're still in the world of artificial narrow intelligence. So um, that means it can only do limited things. It's narrow. Um, but it's on the borderlines of narrow to general. When we go to general intelligence, that means it doesn't need any information in its database. It can produce original ideas without any background data. So a bit like you and me, um, that we don't know something, we know how to find out something. So that artificial general intelligence will be able to do that. At the moment, artificial narrow intelligence needs data. Um, and uh, artificial general intelligence doesn't need that data. So that's coming, and that's just around the corner. So it will think like humans. So where does it get its information from? It can't just, uh, you know, dream it out of space, can it? Am I being well, daft? Well, well, let me tell you about a little conversation I had with ChatGPT the other day. Uh, I was uh, preparing a class on psychology of entrepreneurship, um, and I thought, I'll just ask ChatGPT what it would do. So I, I wanted to, you know, I was preparing a, a lecture on a particular aspect of it. So I asked ChatGPT, um, what should I put in my lecture to cover these this topic? And within 10 seconds, it produced me a two-hour lecture plan. And I'm thinking, are you looking over my shoulder, mate? Because... <laughs> That's almost entirely what I'd got in my lecture plan. But it used a phrase which I wasn't aware of. Um, so it used the, uh, it used the phrase was the entrepreneurship assessment behavior framework. Now, there are um, standard psychological measures of entrepreneurial capability, um, and they are um, you know, well known within the, the sector as uh, ways that you could assess somebody to see how entrepreneurial they are. 
Um, so that it's more academic. You know, entrepreneurs don't go online and say, can I do the EMP, please, um, to see that if I've got, you know, an entrepreneurial mind. Um, they know they're entrepreneurial. So they, they don't bother doing the test. It's for us as psychologists to help understand what makes an entrepreneur succeed. So, um, and I'd never heard of this framework. So I thought, I thought, you know, I teach psychology of entrepreneurship for quite a while, and I thought I knew the frameworks and so on. So I thought, I don't know where that is. So I have a quick look in the textbook that I've got. I uh, can't find anything about it there. Quick look online. Uh, can't find anything about it there. So I go back to chat GPT and I said, this uh, framework that you've just mentioned, I can't find it anywhere. Where did you find it? And it came back. It didn't use these words, but it used a very good form of words to basically say, well, you won't find it. I've made it up. And so I then said, okay, that's interesting. What would you put in it? Anyway, what would, what would you suggest goes in that framework? And it took it about another 30 seconds and it produced me a five component framework. And when I started to look at this framework, I realized that it had come up something with completely original and actually something that probably researchers in entrepreneurial behavior have been looking for for, you know, 100 years. And the, the thing is that when we assess uh, behavior in entrepreneurs, all of the measurement models that we've got at the moment are qualitative. In other words, they're not associated with numbers. They're associated with the way they think, the reactions they have, and all of those kind of things. And we can go into depth about, you know, what's going on in somebody's head. What um, ChatGPT came up with is quantitative numbers that we can measure that determine whether or not somebody is an entrepreneur successful entrepreneur will they be a successful entrepreneur and so now it's produced a model that nobody else has been able to produce psychology researchers for decades have been looking for a quantitative model chat gpt produced it in 30 seconds Gee. so will we, will we see the next book by graham jones about the psychology of entrepreneurship <laughs> um, you were copyrighted you, by you you will certainly see my research paper coming up with a new model of entrepreneurship being published. Um, and But I will have to credit ChatGPT as a source of information. But that's fine. Because now what I can do is I can go and look at the literature on the models that are used, assess the new model in relation to the previous literature, do some research using the ideas that it suggested. So I've got some data that shows that it actually works and come up with a new model. Wow. Wow. Okay. I was going to ask you what um, people that are working with head teachers should be doing about it because we talked earlier, didn't we? There's no, there's no central body dealing with this. Every university has to uh, plow their own farrow. Is that, is that right? Um, and yeah, universities are independent, but so, so are schools. They're all independent with their own governors. And even though the, the governments will say, you know, this is the national curriculum and these are the frameworks, how you work within those frameworks are entirely up to the local governance. And so, um, yeah, they've got to decide for themselves what they will do. And so the exam boards will advise, the um, regulators will advise. Um, but, yeah, everybody is scratching their heads as to what do we do about the potential for cheating. So when I was, we've now got a measure that, so I've just been marking some assignments and we've got a measure that looks at, did this come from chat GPT? So if you write something, if chat GPT writes something, you can then go and ask chat GPT, did you write this? And it will say, yes, I did write this. So we have now got assignments where the, um, the checker, the check-in system that we use is effectively going into the background, into ChatGPT, asking, did you write this? And I've got 10 students so far this term who have 100% assignment written by ChatGPT. So that means they went, that rather than doing the work themselves, they went to ChatGPT. Um, and so the, they didn't realise, of course, that we can check. Um, so we can check for plagiarism in all kinds of ways. But the problem is 
that actually ChatGPT is not always right. So I had a little argument with ChatGPT the other day, uh, and it works best if you have a conversation with it. So um, that uh, the argument I had was that one of my um, colleagues had show, been able to see that this student had um, written supposedly 100% of their material was written by ChatGPT. ChatGPT confirmed that that was the case. The student was adamant that they'd never been anywhere near ChatGPT. So because I'm the director, the, that complaint comes up to me. Um, so I look at it and it says, no, ChatGPT says nothing to do with me. So the student is right. So I go back to the lecturer and say, show me what you did. And the lecturer did what I thought he did. And we do it on his computer again. And on his computer, ChatGPT says, yes, I did write this. Do it on my computer, ChatGPT says, no, I didn't write this. So I then have a little argument with ChatGPT saying, why are you giving me two different answers for the same piece of information? And it went into a very lengthy explanation about context. Um, and you, know, you just have one word difference in the question you ask it, and it will come up with a completely different answer. So just like human beings, it's fallible. Hmm. It can make mistakes. So this is getting quite interesting, Graham. So what did you do with the student? Uh, I allowed the student's work to be marked normally. Okay. Good, good. Question in the chat box says, if two people ask chat GPT the same question, will they get the same answer? No. Okay. <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> okay. Well, that's done my head in, so I don't get We won't you, go into you, that. You will, get, you will get very similar answers. But it depends upon the phrasing you used in the question. If you used exactly the same question, then you will get the same answer. But it only needs something like a comma or, you know, where the emphasis of the sentence changes. You know, mm, okay. it's... let's. Um, so let's turn to uh, universities and how are attendances at universities going? Because there's been a lot of issues about that a lot of issues about universities losing money can't afford to keep going you, in fact you told us two or three universities were almost pulling the receiver in last time well, you were on. What's yeah there, there are still are seven universities as far as i know um at the bottom end of um problems um and you know got financial issues uh, so yet yeah, it's still a big issue um that universities have a problem uh, student funding is a problem uh, so we've got doctors on strike uh, the average um, medical student leaves university now with 100,000 pounds worth of debt um, and they're having to pay nine percent interest uh, uh, on that so um, that's enormous uh, the ridiculous thing is that the cost of running the student loan system in the UK is more expensive than the government just paying the fees themselves. So um, there's a political choice that's been made that we shouldn't, the taxpayers shouldn't be seen to be paying for students. So students should be seen to be paying for themselves, but that is actually more expensive to the taxpayer than the taxpayer paying in the first place. So there's a whole big issue that's putting students off. So we're not getting enough people applying for certain degrees because of the um, debt that they will incur. So those things that incur lots of debt. So medicine's one, architecture is another because architecture is seven years training. Uh, you've got lots of uh, others. Uh, so nursing is a big issue because up until three or four years ago, nursing was paid for out of a bursary system. Uh, now nurses are getting debts of about 50 to 60,000 uh, to train as a nurse. So, um, you know, the average student debt is about 50 something thousand now. Um, so huge debts that they're building up. Um, and so big, big problems in terms of people not wanting to, to become students. We are benefiting because the uh, number of 18 year olds now is rising. Um, so it had fallen dramatically five years ago. Um, so... Uh, that was all to do with uh, millennium babies and everything else. So there was a big dip in the number of babies. Um, and so that, you know, translated into um, 
everybody who was looking for 18, 19 year olds, not just us, but apprentices and uh, people who, you know, workplaces looking for uh, school leavers, everybody had trouble. Uh, now that trouble is easing. Uh, but um, yeah, we're seeing, uh, we just had an open day on Saturday and it's the most successful open day that we've had in the last six or seven years. Um, so things are are looking up in terms of uh, people applying to university. Wow, nine percent interest. I can't get my head around that. That's uh, compounded up to almost is, yeah. inability for most people to repay it. What on earth is anyone thinking about? And the cost is not not nine percent unless the government signed a deal with the uh, student loan company that um, they can make a lot of money out of it. That's uh, yeah, a disgrace. Okay, let's, um, <laughs> let's yeah, let's move on to something more positive. Sales consultancy. You're still doing your sales and internet consultancy um, on Zoom, I presume, with your full time job at uh, the University of Buckingham. Yep. Uh, I did one this afternoon. What's worrying people in that area at the moment? Uh, well, what's actually Chat GPT is a worry for for people because they think that. Um, it, they don't need salespeople anymore. And in fact, I think in the world of, world of sales, it's been coming for a long time. But um, there's this kind of this kind of three levels of sale. There's transactional sales. There you just it's just simple transaction. You you press yep. a button online, you buy something. Yeah. There's that kind of middle ground of sales, which is you know, should I buy this? Should I buy that? What's the comparison? Or there's a very complicated sale. Um, and gradually over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, we've seen this, the divergence grow greater so that nobody's really needed, no humans really are needed for transactional sales now. We can do transactional sales very well with computers. Um, we don't need people to do them. But complicated sales need people. And so I think a lot of organizations, certainly ChatGPT, can do your transactions. It can do all the follow-ups. It can do everything that you might be doing at the moment uh, with people. You don't need people anymore to do those transactions. In fact, if you put people into transactional sales, you slow them down, and that puts off your customers. So actually, if you're doing transactional sales, chuck the whole load onto the internet, forget anything else. Uh, get ChatGPT to do all the follow-ups for you, sort everything out. All those transactions can be nicely done using technology. Now what you can concentrate on are those complicated sales, those things where consultative selling is required. Uh, and that requires lots of human interaction. It requires relationship building, all those kind of things that artificial intelligence can't yet do. I use the word yet advisedly um, but at the moment um, so at the moment we can't uh, use artificial intelligence to do those kind of sales so concentrating on consultative selling is going to be much more important to businesses um, than worrying about the transactional selling and for the, in the businesses that I meet they worry too much about the transactions and making sure it's you just trust the technology as long as it's set up right, and as long as your computer engineers and people and your web designers and so on have done it right, tie that into ChatGPT, transactional sales will no longer need to involve a human. Fantastic, Graham. Well, Graham, we've come to the end of the interview. Thank you again for joining us. Is there one last thing that you'd uh, like to give the uh, tip you'd like to give the audience? <laughs> but, Thank you. Uh, I often say that. You know, you've got to keep up to date with technology. It's even more important now um, that technology is overtaking many businesses. And so if you don't keep up with what's going on, you are going to face problems in business. It's much more important that you keep up with technology nowadays because so much is happening. That is, you know, when we saw the Internet arrive, we saw... You know, lots of businesses disappear because they didn't keep up with the technology and gradually as social media marketing and so on introduced new kind of business models. Those older business models disappeared. Uh, you know, we saw some big businesses, Woolworths and so on, disappear because they didn't keep up to date with what was going on. Um, it's going to be the same again, that, um, but it's going to be bigger. Yeah, so the whole artificial intelligence world it's going to make it much more important that you keep up to date with what's going on in technology and using it, not just reading about it, but use it. 
Brilliant, Graham. Thanks for joining Monday Night Live. I'm looking forward to seeing you on the 16th of June at our top masterclass at the Victory Services Club yep. in London with our other fantastic guest speakers. Remind everybody how they sign up for it. Uh, they go to Eventbrite yeah, and look at what they don't teach you at business schools. Brilliant. Graham Jones, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you again in another six months' time. Mm-hmm.